Welcome everyone, I'm Don Wilcox. Um, I'm a member of the Center for Computational Sciences and Engineering at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And our group works on a software package called AMRX. Um, that, that means AMR, AMR for exascale, where, where we do block structured adaptive mesh refinement. And <clears throat> there are lots of pretty pictures here that are uh, sample codes that, that are built on top of AMRX. AMR. So I'm going to get more into trying to answer this question. What is AMRX? That's the main goal of this talk. Um, hopefully at the end of this talk, you'll get a feel for um, what the language of block structured adaptive mesh refinement is, um, particularly since it's, it's now the um, underlying software framework for CarpetX. And um, so this can give you a better understanding of, um, of the direction that Einstein toolkit development is going under the hood. Um, and with that in mind, um, with that in mind, let's, let's just get some background out of the way. AMRX is a block structured adaptive mesh refinement framework that we develop. Um, originally, this package was developed for, um, for solving time-dependent PDEs um, in fluids, um, but now it can do a lot more than that. Um, and so the, the basic idea here, you can probably see from, from these pictures is that, um, so on the lower right, you've got like a set, a set of grids um, that are arranged in levels where at, on the very bottom, you've got level zero, that's your very coarsest level that com comprises cells that represent a de computational domain. At level one, you've got one level of refinement where those cells are smaller and cover a, a region of the, of the level zero cells. And then level two is another level of refinement on top of that. <clears throat> so just to, just to look at the geometry of these refined pieces, you'll notice that, um, that the refined pieces are shaped as squares. Um, and there's something important here. If you compare the level one and level two grids, where the grid outlines are in bold, what you see here is that there, there are two basic properties to keep, to keep in mind for block structured AMR the AMRX style. Property one is that the union of grids at a particular level is contained within the level immediately below it, coarser than, than the, in the AMR hierarchy. That is to say, if you want, if you have, if you have a, a, a if you have a set of grids, or if, sorry, if you have a set of cells that define your domain, and you decide that you want to refine a, a subset of those cells, the, the subset of those cells that you have to refine should be contained within your existing domain. That's thing one. Thing two is that um, the, the grids that we break the domain into in a particular level um, are not related to each other on a different level in a strict parent-child hierarchy. Um, really, all we require is that the union of grids on a particular level be contained within a, the level below it. Um, and so the flexibility of this software library has, um, has given rise to its application in lots of different fields. So you know about the Einstein toolkit, there are lots of other applications that are now built on top of AMRX, um, including lots of projects that are funded through the Exascale Computing Project. Um, and that includes, um, that includes uh, WarpX, which is a particle and cell electromagnetics code for, um, for accelerator design and uh, for particle accelerator design. And uh, PaleLM is a low Mach number combustion code um, 
Flash 5, or now Flash X is a is an astrophysics code um, for which some of you are probably familiar with for doing um, radiation hydrodynamics. Um, we do multi-phase flow as well. There's MFIX XS. So there's a there's a picture on the, the top right here, which is a um, a chemical looping reactor with a person to scale next to it. And um, and we have AMR for this reactor geometry um, to, to simulate the, the chemistry in this reactor, um, which is an exciting project. Um, we, we also do some cosmology, and all of these are different ECP projects that, that are based on AMRX now. So why would someone want to use AMRX for a project? Um, why would, um, you know, and by extension, why would the developers of the Einstein Toolkit want to use AMREX as, um, as the Carpet X backend. Well, AMREX provides lots of features basically that um, are built into the software library that you don't have to program yourself if you want, if you want to take advantage of these. Um, we support C14 as well as Fortran. Um, Fortran is really a legacy option, but and most of our codes are moving away from, or have moved, already moved away from Fortran or just C++, but we've still got some Fortran interfaces. Um, and we support, um, probably the biggest reason to use AMREX is that AMREX includes several different kinds of parallelism. So at, at, the, at the distributed memory level, we use MPI to break up um, patches on our domain and um, send them to different processors. And I'm going to explain how that works a little bit later. Um, but basically, we send pieces of our domain to different processors on a, on a supercomputer using MPI. And then we accelerate um, those subsets of the domain on the processors that are on the nodes that we have sent them to. Um, using either OpenMP, OpenACC, or CUDA, um, or EVC++. Um, and the, uh, the advantage of this is that the fine-grained parallelism, that is the X in MPI plus X, is, um, is built into AMREX. And you don't, have to, you don't have to write CUDA kernels yourself. Um, that's something that that you'll see a bit later. Um, one thing to mention though, is that in addition to having cool GPU features um, built into AMREX, you also really don't have to do uh, memory management for GPUs yourself. Um, AMREX provides these um, memory arenas where our data is allocated that, that if you compile for GPUs, we'll use um, CUDA unified memory and prevent you from having to manually copy data back and forth between a CPU and a GPU. That's, that's really exciting. It's, it makes for rapid development. Um, we have um, single and multi-level mesh operations. Um, uh, this is called, and there, this label is explicit and implicit operations. I'm going to have a list of different single and multi-level mesh operations later on to show exactly what you can do. Um, but the, the, the basic utility here is that if you want to do single and multi-level mesh operations, you can call a high-level abstract function for, say, filling ghost cells throughout the domain or filling boundary conditions. And all of the communication between nodes is, is handled automatically for you. So you never actually have to write any MPI calls yourself. AMREX handles that. Um, so um, AMREX also builds in different multi-level synchronization options. If you want to um, average data down from a uh, refined level onto an underlying coarser level, um, or, or, um, or in, choose or customize how you want to interpolate between levels, or if you want um, flux registers, say, at coarse fine boundaries, if you're, if you're doing something that requires them. Um, to enforce conservation, things like that. Uh, things like that are built into AMREX. Um, 
AMREX also provides particle and particle mesh algorithms. So I'm going to show an example of that later on. But basically, um, various applications that you might want to to write. Say if you want to do a say you want to do a, a Monte Carlo um, radiation hydrodynamics uh, scheme with um, with finite volume for the fluid and Monte Carlo for the radiation. You could do that with AMRX because we support AMR for mesh data as well as um, as well as particle data structures if you want. Um, if you have a linear system that you want to solve, you can solve parabolic and elliptic systems using a our built-in geometric multigrid solver, um, and all of that is is accelerated on GPUs. By the way, you don't have to do anything special to use that. If you need embedded boundaries, we can do that. Um, and then we have various load balancing strategies built in and an IO format that's supported by the big IO, uh, or sorry, the big visualization tools like Visit, ParaView, and MIT. Um, these are just a list of features. Um, I do wanna mention something about the, the AMR that sort of sets AMREX apart from other AMR packages. Um, and the, the key thing here is that um, AMREX, AMREX is, is an example of a structured grid um, adaptive mesh refinement approach. And um, this, this key features of AMREX are, are demonstrated on the left here. So um, compare that, for example, to um, an octree based refinement scheme that, for example, is a parameter is used in flash shown on the right. So in an octree scheme, you have, um, if you want to refine a cell or, or a patch of cells, then you've got to, along each dimension, cut those cell, cut the, the cell DX by a factor of two. And then you've got this child parent scheme for the grids that you've refined um, that you organize into a tree. Um, what that leaves you with is the grid sizes in your domain on a given level that are the same size. Um, that's not the case in the MRX. At a given level, you can have whatever size grids you want. Um, and the, the child grids on refined levels don't have unique parents. So you can see on this schematic on the left, You've got um, the course level in black with cells outlined in, in thin edges. Level one in blue is the next refined level. Um, you'll notice that's contained within black. And then level two, the, the second refined level is in red. And notice that, um, notice that we've got a, a red grid that overlaps the intersection, or sorry, the, um, the edges between two blue grids. Um, so there's not a strict parent-child relationship here. The only requirement um, for this style of block-structured AMR is that your grids um, must be contained within the, the level below, and, um, and that's pretty much it. So, um, so this allows us great flexibility to refine a mesh exactly in the regions of interest for your code. Um, and um, and doesn't require very much bookkeeping, uh, as well as still giving you hierarchical parallelism, um, where we loop over levels and then loop over grids within each level um, in order to, to implement uh, an algorithm. So I mentioned this already. I think this is just another slide showing pack, a patch base for this tree refinement. Um, the key thing to point out is that we still have logically rectangular grids or, or patches on our domain, and um, and those are organized by levels. Um, so we don't have a picture for in Octree. We have this picture of a tree with leaves, um, and where where each where you see each uh, each step from in this Octree picture each step down on this tree is a level of refinement. And then you keep track of which leaves you have for each node. That's not the case in block structured AMR like this. 
um, in the AMREC style. We have a level that is defined by a set of grids. Um, and those grids are distributed across MPI. And then you, if you want to loop over all the cells in the domain, you loop over levels, and then you loop over grids within each level. So um, this leads to a parallelism strategy that that corresponds to the to this graphical picture on the right, where you can you've got a set of grids and use MPI to distribute grids to different processors. And if you're using a CPU, then use OpenMP over logical tiles within each grid. So the point here is in the top panel, in the top part of this graphic, you've got a red and a green, um, red and green colored grids that are inside your domain um, with represented also by circles and squares for, for the cells. Um, those are distributed to different processors over MPI. Um, and then the next step is, okay, what if I have different cores on a given processor that I want to use OpenMP with? Well, then you take each grid and you split it up into logical tiles. So these are, um, these are simply different low and high indexes within the box that defines a grid that defines loop bounds. Um, it doesn't partition data, it is simply logical loop bounds for, for your loops. And those are different colors here in each, in each grid. And that's what you distribute to, to threads within an MPI rank. Um, we support static versus dynamic scheduling. Um, you can overlap communication and computation. And, um, and that's, that's, that's the strategy for CPUs. If you've got GPUs, then, then we, we use a different strategy um, where instead of, um, instead of using OpenMP threads, we now want to use GPU threads. And instead of looping over tiles, like in the, in the blue and orange picture shown above, instead of looping over just tiles containing many cells where one thread gets lots of cells to, to process, we distribute individual cells to CUDA threads. Um, or rather to, to GPU threads if you're more generally if you're using an AMD GPU. Um, and those cells are shown in different colors here uh, in the lower panel where um, each GPU thread gets one cell or, or three cells or two cells. You can customize that. The point is that um, our GPU paralyz parallelization strategy um, is if you want to write an AMREX code, is, is built into um, to lots of parts of AMREX automatically and works really well if you can um, design your work loops so that you're applying the same kind of operation to all the cells in at, on a particular level at the same time. Um, and with that, I just want to mention, okay, what kind of operations do we support uh, for a single level or for multi-level codes? And then, um, and then once we get a feel for what kind of operations AMREX provides, then I'll show a, a couple of examples of simple codes that you can build on top of AMREX and, um, and show just what the code looks like so that you can see how, how this works. Um, so if you, if you just have a single level in your domain, um, you're, you're, go you're going to need these things, or you might need these things. Um, the first is that you'll probably want some sort of parallel copy mechanism. Um, that is, you want, to, you want to be able to copy data um, between different, you want to be able to copy data between different versions of your, of your grid. And we store, the, the data for a given level in something called a multifab. Um, and you want to be able to, so say, say you can have a, multi, a multifab contains different variables, say density and temperature um, across the grid. And say you want to be able to copy your grid data for density, um, but it's spread over MPI ranks. So you want to, you want this copy to take place on every MPI rank. Well, we can do that. We can even do that if 
We can even do that if um, you're copying between multifabs, that is distributed memory data structures with different assignments of grids to FBI ranks. Um, we can do general math too, like addition or multiplication uh, in parallel like this over MBI. Um, and then that's that if you call a copy or add um, function in AMRX for your grid data, that automatically, if you're running on GPUs, will automatically launch GPU kernels under the hood. So stuff like that is very easy for you. And again, you don't have to write any MBI calls to do any communication. Um, you can also do general go cell operations. So for any, for any stencil based code, um, if you've got, if you say you've got derivatives in some, in some PDE that you're just, that you've discretized now, then in order to compute those for a given cell, you're going to have to access cells next to you. And okay, well, that's great if you're in the interior of a grid, but what if you're on the edge of a grid um, or you're on the edge of your domain? The way that's, that's handled generally is you introduce padded, a, padding, a padded layer of cells around each grid in your domain, including around the domain boundary. And these are, these are essentially placeholder cells that you that store copies from other cells in your domain or that store boundary conditions for those grids. And then you only loop in the interior of a grid to do work, um, but you still get to access values in Go cells. That's a general approach for stencil codes. Um, and when you want, when you, when you're using Go cells, there are a couple different things that, that you might want to do. One is you're going to want to do something that we call fill boundary. That is, you want to be able to fill ghost cells from the valid cells in the domain that they correspond to, wherever they are. And this will require you to, to communicate between MPI ranks that your data lives on. Um, you, you might also want to do something called that we call some boundary. That is, that is, say you've got data in the ghost cells and you want to add that data into the valid cells that they represent. Um, for, a, um, for a finite volume code, that's really, that, that you, wouldn't, you wouldn't need that. You really just need fill boundary. Some boundary comes up though for particle and cell codes. So say you've done a particle and cell deposition from particles to your grid, well, you're going to have, in order to ensure conservation, you for you know, a higher order particle and cell scheme than, than zeroth order, you need your particles to deposit into, um, into ghost cells. And then you need to sum those values from ghost cells into the valid cells. So we can do that for you um, automatically. You just call a function called sum boundary. Um, so suppose you have particles that you want to, to work with we support neighbor particles and lists. So if you've got particles on your grid, you, we can compute, say, if you want to do something similar to like molecular dynamics, you can, we can compute for each particle, a list of all of the particles near it, nearest to it that might be collision partners over the next however many steps. Um, we can copy particles between different processors um, in a, in a, that, that act like ghost particles, similar to ghost cells. Um, so, and we have built-in tools for doing all of this. Um, and then um, say you want to do general particle mesh deposition and interpolation. We can do this with a user supplied C++ Lambda function where you give us a Lambda function that defines what a particle should do to, how a particle should deposit to um, grid cells in its, in its neighborhood. And, um, and we handle all of the, the parallelization. So these are, these are very powerful tools that you can essentially use to, to build up whatever parallel um, grid or particle algorithm you want. Um, and more generally, suppose you, want to, suppose you want to extend this and now go to multiple levels. You're going to need to do some communication, but not only between different levels, but also between the processors that that data lives on. And 
we have that built in. So this includes um, interpolation and restriction operations for AMR, where you want to fill ghost cells and set interpolation schemes for cell, face, or node-centered data, which we also which we, we support all of that. Um, and then you can customize what refinement ratio you want between levels. Um, we have tools for averaging fine data to, so even if you're not interpolating, we have tools for averaging fine data onto coarse data when you need to do some kind of synchronization between levels. Um, and, and anytime you have, um, anytime you're solving a system of PDEs where it's important to ensure conservation whenever you have numerical fluxes on your grid that you're working with, um, you have to be careful about the, the boundaries between fine and coarse levels. And so we include data structures that, um, that store data at those boundaries. Uh, these data structures we call flux registers. This lets you store fluxes at coarse fine interfaces so that you can easily enforce conservation um, between levels. Um, and so, um, so here, here's a picture to reference really for this. And, um, and so, so the arrows show directions that you can go for doing interpolation between levels, um, as well as um, in the, in the gray outlines or in the green outlines, um, you've got boundary cells um, uh, at the edges of, of each grid. So we provide built-in operations for filling those ghost cells for regridding uh, based on, that is for calculating a new set, a new AMR hierarchy uh, based on your custom, um, adaptive mesh refinement criteria. So you, that is, you provide a logical, uh, 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 you provide a Boolean function that tells us, okay, for a given cell, should this be refined or not? And then for each level, we go and check for all the cells on, on the domain, should this cell be refined? And then we tag it for refinement. If not, we, we don't. And you can call this regridding function every so many time steps you want. And, um, and whenever you call it, compute a new set of grids. And when you compute, when you compute a new set of grids, we interpolate and um, we interpolate an average data from the existing grids onto the new grids. Um, so um, all of this is built in and to AMRX, essentially you call a regrid function and then you call a fill patch function for handling um, filling a, a given level's worth of data from existing levels. Um, so stuff like this is, is built in for you and you don't, again, you don't need to worry about MPI, you don't need to worry about launching CUDA kernels to handle this, all of that is under the hood. Um, and if you've got, so one thing important to point out is that if you've got particles on your domain, as well as um, cell-centered, face-centered, or node-centered data, if you've got particles, then whenever you move them around, they'll move to different between grids from a grid owned by one processor to a, a grid owned by a different processor. And when you do that, you'll have to actually communicate that particle data from one processor to the other. We handle this using a redistribute function for particles um, that moves them to the right level grid and uh, tile and, and processor whenever they physically move in your domain. Um, so communication uh, features like that are all built in. We also support various kinds of time stepping options. So, um, so this is this is a AMRX doesn't include a time integrator by itself. We developed various time integrators um, in our codes, but but fundamentally we give you the tools for doing the communication and the data layout that I've described. And then you get to choose what kind of time integration you want to do. Generally, um, there are a couple of, of there are a couple of big approaches. I mean, independent of exactly what integrator integrator you want to use, like Ronkakata or something, there are there are two basic approaches to time integration with AMR. Um, 
and that's basically non-subcycling or subcycling in time. Um, which subcycling time means you take multiple time steps on fine levels relative to course levels. So you can imagine if you've got a CFL condition that your fluid should satisfy, then at each level, you only take time steps that are limited by the CFL of that level. And what that lets you allow, what let, that lets you do is, um, is you can, you'll have to synchronize data between levels, um, but you, um, you only advance a level and the number of times that you need to for its CFL, you don't need to advance the course levels at the fine time step. Um, that does make your algorithm more comp complicated, um, but we provide synchronization features um, like the average down or uh, fill, fill patch that are useful for, for implementing this. Um, so with that in mind, let's, you know, that's, that's kind of the general high, the high level idea of what kinds of tools AMREX provides. I just want to show um, what, what a simple AMREX code looks like. If you want to, if, what vocabulary do you need? And generally, what, um, what, what are you thinking if you want to write an AMREX code? Well, there, there's, I'm just going to introduce some vocabulary. I've already mentioned a little bit of this, but this is the basic vocabulary you need to understand the AMR data structures. Um, First thing is a, a box. Well, an infect is a is a is a, a array of length number of dimensions that we use for indexing. A box is the important bit. Um, it's simply a set of low indexes and a set of high indexes that define an index space. And we also have built on top of that a box array. That is a union of boxes at a given level. You can think of a box as uh, the index space for a grid and then a collection of grids as one level in your domain. Um, F array box or fab um, is then array, array data that is defined on the index space for a box. It can be uh, double precision, single precision integer, complex data, whatever you want, but it's essentially a four dimensional array that corresponds to, um, to a box or a grid. Um, and then a multifab is simply a collection of those arrays. So it's a, co a collection of F array boxes at a single level. And a multifab is a, essentially a C++ object that is a distributed data structure defined by a, what we, is called a distribution mapping. That is a one-to-one um, -one correspondence of grids to MPI ranks. Um, and so, if you want to go and define the, the, this kind of data structure in a C++ app, application, this is the approach, this is what that code will look like. Um, and I'm not gonna go through all of the steps here. I'm just gonna point out what these red arrows are pointing to. First, we define a C++ object that stores the grid geometry. That is to say, the low and high um, physical extent of your domain, as well as the number of cells in each dimension that define your index space, along with whether what kind of geometry you've got, or what kind of coordinate system you've got. Is it Cartesian, for example, or spherical or cylindrical? Um, is it periodic? And then based on this geometry data, um, we combine that with a distribution mapping. A distribution mapping is simply um, a mapping of MPI ranks to grids that define your domain on a given level. And then when you create a multifab, you give the constructor for a multifab the list of boxes that define your uh, that define a, your the grids on a given level, the distribution mapping that maps those boxes to MPI ranks, and then the number of components that is the number of variables you want to store, and the number of ghost cells that that multifab should have, and you've got a distributed data structure that you can do MPI parallel operations with. Very simply. Um, so, um, with that in mind, let's see. Um, yeah, okay, we've got a little bit of time. With that in mind, um, suppose you want to suppose you want to go and loop over this data. 
um, the way this works is here's a sample function where we have a vector of these multifabs that you pass into a function. Um, and you want to work with, with this vector of multifabs. The first thing to do is to loop over levels where each level is one multifab in this vector. And um, you grab the multifab that is the data on a given level. And then the second loop here is, 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 a, is really um, the interesting one because that's a loop over whenever every MPI rank that hits this inner loop is there, the second loop here will loop over the local grids that it that are on that MPI rank. Um, and so if every MPI rank, so rather not if, but when, when every MPI rank hits this second loop, it will loop over all of the grids that it owns. When all MPI ranks do this, you've just looped over all of the grids on a given level in your domain. So that's this, that's what's called an MF iter loop. That is a multifab iterator. Um, you grab the box that defines the index space on a given grid, and then, then an array, a four-dimensional array that defines the, the data in this box. We call that an array four. Um, and then we've got a parallel four function that oh, takes the box indexes that define the low and high and, take, and takes a, a C++ Lambda function um, that takes indexes i, j, k, that captures a uh, essentially this 4D array that stores a pointer to that data. And, um, and this array for object also gives you an access operator in parentheses that let you access I, in, um, indexes i, j, k, and then component index in this 4D array. And it's that simple. Um, um, I've got a question for this, because this came up when Eric wrote Carpet X. Um, is there a way to have, say, a pool of these threads? And then, say, if I have to solve for two different systems at the same time, maybe in our case, geometry and fluid, to kind of throw them all into a pool of tasks, essentially, and then have it iterate through? Or is that not yet supported? Is that planned? Um, yeah, you can do that. Um, in fact, that's what Einstein Toolkit does. Right. Um, I just, I don't have space in this example to, to show that, but essentially you make a, um, essentially you put this parallel four call into a Lambda function you store a set of those Lambda functions into, into a container, and then you loop over those Lambda functions and call them. Okay, um, but that's sufficiently out. supported. Yes, yes. In fact, this, so yeah, this is exactly what, um, what Eric Schneider is doing in, in Carpidex. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know what line to point you to in the source code, but um, I'm, I'm sure Eric could point you to it. But yeah, um, that is supported. You just have to you just have to store. Um, oh, you can't see my mouse pointer. Can I annotate. Yeah, I can annotate. You have to store this statement into a lambda function, and you store a data structure out here to contain those lambda functions. And then here you call, you loop over them and call them. Call all the random functions down here. And, um, and essentially this inner, this second loop will queue up a list of tasks for you. And then out down here, you go and, and call those tasks. Um, and then after that, you do any synchronization you need. So um, the only thing you have to be careful about when you do that is that um, is to only do that for a given level at a time. If you need to do, if you've got some complicated AMR scheme, you don't want to do that for all the levels at the same time. If you have, for example, a subcycling and time time integrator. Um, if you're advancing all the levels without subcycling, though, then you could get away with that. Um, okay, so I want to I want to I clean all the annotations. So. Yeah, all drawings. There we go. Um, so if, for the sake of time, I'm going to go quickly here. But really, the, the only thing to point out is that uh, we, have, we have Lambda functions with macros that you can, so AMREX GPU device labels this Lambda function um, with a macro that if you compile for GPUs, this becomes, with CUDA, that for example, this becomes underscore, underscore, device, underscore, underscore, to mark up this Lambda function 
as a function that should be compiled as a, a GPU kernel function. Um, and this code looks exactly the same as for a CPU, is the, the thing to point out. Um, and the reason this works is that the multifab data uses a, a memory arena that allocates memory on a GPU. Um, so with that, I want to show a couple of very simple examples. Um, uh, sorry, before you go on, um, could you answer one quick question about the code? Um, how would you set up some things that does not just operate point-wise, but uses neighboring cells like a stencil that didn't become clear? So would I just have I plus one or something and uh, instead of IJK, how does it work in? Exactly. Um, so you would replace this with, um, you, you could set the right-hand side of this. So here we're setting component zero, that is the, the, index, the variable indexed with uh, index zero for the cell IJK. Here we're just setting it to one for all of the, the cells. But for on the right-hand side of this equal sign, if you want to put, you can put any stencil operations here you want where you're accessing array data at say, I minus one, J plus one, K minus one. Um, and um, you, you can do that if you want to. Um, you can have, although in that case, I wouldn't use the same, um, I wouldn't use the same 40 array here to, that you're working with just to avoid any, any data races. You would want to um, have one multifab that stores the, the data that you want to, to create, and then one multifab that stores the, the copy of the grid that you are, you're evaluating your stencils on um, to avoid data races. Um, does that make sense? Um, yeah, so. You have around okay. two minutes left. Okay. Um, so that's the general idea to, um, um, if you have any more questions about like how exactly to implement that, definitely follow up and I'm happy to spend time talking about that. Um, here's an example, just to give you a visual for how this works, where we're advecting a scalar field that represents a blob of dye in a fluid clockwise and then counterclockwise in a predetermined velocity field uh, according to this advection equation. And really the thing to, to point out here is that we're we're refining each level. We are refining each level based on the density of this die, and you can see this nested set of grids that evolves with time. So every n time steps, we compute a new cell, set of cells to refine based on just what the value of our variable phi is, and though that refinement follows um, follows the the advection. Um, to show you. Uh, you know, another, uh, there are two more features I want to show you here. This is the same, exactly the same thing, where the One die minute. is represented by this um, this red dot, but all of the data is doesn't live on a grid. There is no um, all of the data is not primarily represented on the grid. It's represented in particles with particle weights that implement a particle and cell deposition scheme. And we use a velocity field that satisfies an incompressible equi uh, flow equation. We solve that using a built-in geometric multigrid. And then we advect particles and we use PIC to deposit and interpolate them onto the grid um, around an embedded boundary that you see here, um, where we're using um, our geometric multigrid together with embedded boundaries to enforce this incompressible velocity constraint around this cylindrical feature. Um, so again, you can do all this in parallel. Um, so with that, if you want any more information, feel free to follow up online to get a copy of our software, look at our documentation, or you can look up movies for different AMREX codes in our gallery. Um, with that, um, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I guess we can spend time during the break uh, if anyone has any questions. Certainly.
So if I got this right, I basically put my whole <clears throat> code that actually defines my evolution system in the Lambda function. Now, my question is, if this is really in the innermost loop, uh, is the compiler able to inline those or will this be a, a bit of a slowdown because there can't be anything like <clears throat> things with branch prediction and so on and Do you have any performance measures how this would compare to a, let's say, hard um, handwritten loop? This would, this would do this. This is so. This is the same thing as a handwritten loop. Um, let me go back to that slide. Um, so this parallel for function is a wrapper for a nested IJK loop for the index space defined by this box. Um, anything that, it, and then the question of, is it inlined or not? It will be uh, if it can be. So the, that is to say, you can call functions inside this Lambda function if you want to. Um, and if those, if a compiler can inline those functions, then it will. Um, what we find useful for that is to define work functions that operate on our stencils in header files that we include so that, so that they can easily be inlined. If you define them in a C++ file that you've got to resolve at link time, then no, it's probably not going to inline it. So you either want to explicitly write out your stencils in this form, or you want to define your um, stencils as functions that you declare as inline in a header that you can include um, and then call inside the Lambda function. But this will have the same performance as a handwritten IJK loop because that's exactly what Parallel 4 does if you've just compiled it on a CPU. If you've compiled it for a GPU, Parallel 4 launches a GPU kernel um, where the IJK entries in that loop are spread out over different GPU threads. Um, but yeah, does that help clarify? Yeah, that makes sense. So uh, I was just wondering how <clears throat> this looks almost too nice to be efficient. <laughs> um, no one else has questions. Maybe I can just go on. Uh, so similarly, this array indices, uh, is that every time I use a different variable, uh, is it like recomputing the actual address uh, or is there some way to sort of define uh, hmm, I know it at IJK and I want to do that for all cells of different variables at a given point because if my operations are quite simple uh, this actually might you end up multiplying indices uh, most of the time. Um, we haven't found that to be significant. I mean we haven't found that to be significant. The compiler optimizer is pretty good at optimizing index calculations um, for access operators like this. Um, and in practice, the right hand, what comes on the right hand side of this equal sign is far more expensive than, than any kind of index calculation. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if, especially if you're doing hydrodynamics, you've got, you know, you're calculating fluxes and solving Riemann problems and evaluating equation of state and stuff like that. I mean, it's- Yeah, there it's no question. I mean, this is way more expensive, but let's say if I have a simple finite difference uh, formula, but with something like tensors with uh, <clears throat> dozens of components, uh, I was wondering, but, I assume this was all performance measured at some point. So yeah. if the data live on the same multifab, then these integer operations are based on the same array sizes. The compiler has a chance of optimizing it. <clears throat> In the Einstein toolkit, however, we do pre-calculate. 